Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. I'm Ryan Honeyman, a partner at Lyft Economy. My guest today is Clay Brown. Clay is the Interim Lead Executive and Head of Standards, Certification, and Product Delivery for B-Lab Global. Clay plays a critical role in evolving, growing, and scaling existing and new programs, products, and tools, including the B Corp certification. He joined B-Lab Global with over 18 years of experience creating and implementing social and environmental programs for established standards organizations, including Fairtrade USA, FlowCert, and the Fairtrade Foundation. Clay, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Nice to be here. Yeah. Well, I guess the first question, Clay, I just like to check in on a human level with people. You know, there's a lot going on in the world right now. And just on a human level, how are you doing right now with everything going on? Yeah, thanks for asking. At the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, which we just passed through, it's definitely a time that I I certainly have spent a lot of time reflecting on how the previous year was and what I want this year to be. And you know, we are obviously living in a time where there's a lot of turmoil and 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 problems that are around us. I personally have been having a real focus on my kind of self-care and well-being as I ended the year, both, you know, really rethinking what I eat and how I move and my use of technology and all of those things. And, you know, it's something that that's really important and almost a sense of it's it's in its own way kind of a a resistance around sort of some of the negative things that are happening that focus on myself and how I can improve how I feel and how I show up in the world. Because I think generally, for any of us who are working to try to make the world a better place, I think a lot of it has to start with ourselves and making sure we show up with the right level of energy and mindset. So I'm certainly entering the new year with that. Wow. I love hearing self-care right off the bat. That's amazing. I feel like so much of us in this work are trying to solve so many problems that we sort of forget about taking care of ourselves. And so I appreciate you for for speaking about that. Yeah. And I think it's important. It's something we've been speaking a lot about in in our organization too. And the fact that, you know, for us to be successful in achieving our mission, we need everyone that we work with to, to be in a place where they are showing up with their full energy and their full passion. And, and, and that's not possible if people are burnt out or, or struggling with other areas. So it's, it's really important for the work we do to, to make sure we're focused on, on our own well-being as well. Well, Clay, could you tell folks a bit about your background and how you first got into the work you're doing today? Yeah, thanks. So I have been spending the last you know, 20 years of my, of my life really focused on working with businesses to improve their social and environmental performance, the way that they show up in the world, the way that they treat their stakeholders, uh, their broader ecosystem, both their environment as well as the people that they work with. During my days at university, I started learning a lot around, I focused on um, international relations and development studies. And during that time, I was really confronted with a lot of the challenges that were happening in particular in the global south and the fact that communities there were highly dependent on their relationships with the global north or the more wealthier economies. And so at times, I think that can feel like what are the paths to address that? A lot of people work in government or international development. And I was really lucky enough to kind of finish my degree around the time that the concept of fair trade was really starting to take off. I'm American, but I was living in the UK at the time. And fair trade was starting to take off. People started understanding the concept. And I was just really intrigued by the idea that business had a role to play in addressing some of these development challenges that communities were facing. And so I really just got lucky. And I walked in and I volunteered first. I I went into the organization. I volunteered literally in the mailroom back in the days when we had mailrooms and sending out materials, promotional materials to communities across the UK who were wanting to make a difference in their own community and spread the word about fair trade and spread the word that it's possible for businesses to act differently in the way they engage their supply chains coming from the global south. And that was really how I got involved. And from there, I've just been a real passionate, engaged believer in the role of business and the responsibility that business has, the way in which they engage with their 
supply chain, their customers, their broader ecosystem as well. And so that led me over time to working in a variety of roles and working to make business a force for good. And and recently it's brought me to B-Lab, which really felt like a perfect home for me using my uh, experience of standard setting, certification, business relationships, supply chain, standards, et cetera, to bring to the work that we're trying to do here at B-Lab. And I couldn't feel more proud and more excited to be working for this organization and the work that we're doing now. That's great. And so I didn't actually know you were American. I was like, wow, this Welsh person has an amazing American accent Um, (laughs) because you're you're living in Cardiff. But where did you grow up? Yeah, I grew up in Kansas City. So a long way from Wales. I'm born and bred in Kansas City, Missouri. I moved to the UK to do my university degrees. And I've lived over here in the UK as well as in Germany for the past uh, 23 years or something. So American abroad. Some people say I still have an American accent. Others say I'm, I have a, an accent that's somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. I'm not sure. But but yeah, that's my, that's my background. And I generally feel like my breadth of experience also covers the United States, the UK, Europe, as well as more of a global perspective, given my background in, in supply chains and fair trade. But my lived experience is very much kind of that transatlantic US, Europe, and, and UK. And that plays really an important role in my, in my job today at B-Lab as well, given kind of where the most advanced B Corp markets are, are, are often in those countries as well. Well, I think part of what we were going to do on this conversation is by the time this podcast is released, B-Lab will have released a new iteration of the new standards. And I'm I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, I think many people, but maybe just what is B-Lab itself, just for folks who don't know. And then, yeah, maybe just talk through like, what is this, what is this new set of standards more broadly? And then we can maybe get into some of the, the different, like what's different about it. So. Just yeah, like brief overview yeah, of B Lab sure. and and you know what are these standards and 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 why? Yeah, we are a an organization, a network, and a movement really that believes that it is possible, not only possible, but it is an imperative that business become a force for good in the world. And our vision is really of an of an inclusive, equitable, and regenerative economy. So we are driving for economic system change. We think that. It is important for businesses to not just put profit first, but really to have purpose over profit and to move away from kind of what we've called the shareholder primacy, whereby companies are really only there to create profits and and, and money for, for their shareholders. Our objective is that businesses should be thinking about the impact they have on all of their stakeholders, and that includes the people that they work with, their customers, the environment that they are operating in, local communities, and that all of those stakeholders should benefit from the activities of a business. There are a number of things that we do as an organization to to help to drive towards that vision, one of which is that we have a, a certification system. So we work with companies who want to be able to tell the world that they are doing things in a way that is better than kind of traditional business does them. And the way we run this certification system is we have a standard and the standard defines the rules or the guidelines about what companies need to do in order to be a company that is a force for good. The standard is also a guide for all companies. So the standard itself is sort of the foundation of everything we do. And it really aims to describe the most important social, environmental, and governance best practices that businesses should follow in order to become a force for good and help deliver on our our mission. We are, as you mentioned, uh, currently undertaking a multi-year project to evolve these standards. They're called the B Corp standards. And we're developing these standards in a consultative manner. So we're working with all of the companies that are currently B Corps, all prospective future B Corps, as well as the wider civil society and the general public uh, to help us ensure that these standards are really addressing those most important social, environmental, and governance issues of our time. And I think when this this podcast airs, we're going to see that it's already out for public consultation, which is really exciting. And we're looking forward to getting all of the, the feedback that we're going to get from, from the community in the same way that we believe that businesses should be listening to their stakeholders as they make decisions. We think it's important that uh, for us to develop standards that are truly impactful, that we listen to uh, our stakeholders as well. Fantastic. And 
Can you give folks a sense of like, what is the material difference between the old quote unquote older standards and these new standards? Like what is the shift that is the main shift that is happening? So folks can understand that. Yeah, thanks. So I think a couple of important things to note. So the B Corp standard, we've been an organization for over 15 years, 16 years now, and we've had a few iterations of our standard. We've had, we're up to the current one that we're working in is called version six. And the version six standard is really the one that we are evolving from into our new standard that's going to be launched soon. There's a few differences that are coming out in this standard. I think one of the important ones is this standard is aiming to be very holistic and to cover a range of impact topics that cover everything related to workers, to the environment, to governance, to pay, to the way that companies um, engage in their with the economic system, etc. Historically, we've operated a model that we call that had a scoring system. So companies could achieve a score of 80 points, and that would mean that they were able to be a certified B Corp. That meant that there would be certain areas where they would be stronger performers and certain areas where they may not be as stronger performers. The new standard is really moving to a place where we want it to be crystal clear about what it means to be a B Corp. And so we're really trying to raise the bar across all of these various impact topic areas. And what that means is that the standard is going to be even more comprehensive than our previous standard. It's going to a place where we're going to be moving away from the flexible approach, which allowed for the score to being very clear about the compliance levels that are needed across all of these various impact areas. So I think that's a really important difference. Um, And it's one that's an important evolution of our model because we're also working in a new environment today, right? Companies have a lot of expectations that are on them regarding their environmental, social, and governance performance. And we want to make sure that our standard is addressing those topics that are much more prevalent in the world today than they were 15 years ago when we first developed our standards. So we're operating in a much more complex and evolved and sophisticated ecosystem. And so our standard is going to be a leader in that space. In order to be a leader in that space, it needs to make sure it's as comprehensive as it can be. And you know, maybe for folks to to make it concrete, you know, like one thing in the new standards, and maybe you could speak to to some of the changes. You know, in the in the previous assessment, it would say things like, you know, do you pay workers a living wage, and you would get a certain amount of points, and you'd have to get a cumulative amount of points to qualify above eighty. Whereas in this new version, it's like, no, you really need to pay a living wage in order to even qualify as a B Corp. And you know, there's. I think there's 10, roughly 10 topic areas where there's sort of more like you kind of have to do this if you want to be a B Corp. And yeah, can you, can you talk through like, what are some of the, maybe like a few examples of like a change that just to kind of drive the point home for folks? Yeah, I think some really important ones that we're, we're building and evolving are one is really focused on climate and the role of businesses in climate change and mitigating the effects of climate change. We are moving to a place where companies that are going to be want to be certified as B Corps are going to have to have very clear climate transition plans so that they're moving their business to a place where they're in line with international targets related to emission reductions, keeping in line with kind of the COP declarations around 1.5 degrees Celsius, etc. So that's a really important one because we believe that business has a role to play in the climate crisis. And that's a criteria that's going to be required of all companies that are coming in. So that's a new area and a really important new area for us. You mentioned the living wage issue, which is also another critical issue for society. We see uh, and this is very important to me and my my background in, in fair trade, the plight of workers in low wage jobs that are not providing sufficient income to have a living to support their communities and their families is very, very real and very important. And we think all B Corps should be rising to that challenge and addressing that problem. So that's another area that definitely being uh, built upon and becoming even more rigorous than has been in, in previous standards that we've had. So those are two just, I think, very important and timely examples. Um, there are more like that. And, and again, excited for people to go into the consultation because one of the things that's really key for us as we enter the consultation is while we want to make sure that our standards are addressing the most important issues of our time, we also want to make sure that they are achievable. It's very important that we set targets and that we set the bar appropriately, but we also want to make sure that companies are able to achieve the standard, right? We're ambitious, but achievable. 
and very relevant to the way companies are operating. So looking forward to hearing more from from the community at large and the business community uh, about the the challenges that might be faced in reaching some of these standards, because what that ultimately will help us do is partner with others and develop develop new programs and offerings that would allow us to help support companies as they go on this journey. No one says it's easy. It's definitely not going to be easy. It may not be attainable from day one, but we do think that companies have a, a responsibility and we want to reward companies that are able to make those efforts and comply with with pretty high standards. And you mentioned this is a consultation. So did you want to say, did you want to invite folks to to comment on them or... Because it's not just you're dropping the final standards, right? Yeah, exactly. That's right. And actually, I'm sure we can somehow get a link out in the in the podcast to to everyone that's listening to this, where they can go to a website that we've developed, which the standard is going to appear in. So there will be a consultation website where we're asking everyone to review the standards and provide comments, questions, and their thoughts about the standard. There'll be some focused and tailored questions, but there'll also be the chance for companies and, and individuals to review them and make make comments as well. So that's going to be a, a, a an effort that's running over the course of January and February. And we're looking to you know solicit as much input as possible into the content of the standards so that we can then revise and amend um, leading to a final uh, standard later on in, in 2024. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning how difficult and big of a challenge this is like to do what you're doing like you're the for folks who don't know you know the the b corp movement had a massive increase and in people applying during the last couple of years so there's more companies that you know you and your team have had to certify and and sort of make sure they're meeting the standards there's basically a transition from like a founder led b lab was a founder led group until you know last couple of years the the shift to B Lab Global and like B Lab US and Canada, not no longer being like the center of the the B Corp universe. You know, there's existing companies who are used to a way, like existing B Corps who are used to a certain standard that you've put together where they like this, you know, 80 points. And some people like it and some people don't like it. And then you have prospective B Corps and then you have multinationals and you have like tiny one person marketing companies. And then you have global regions with different you know, ways that they approach business. And so, and you were just hired like earlier this year, right? Like, or sorry, I guess it was last year. So it's been about 11 months or something. Are you able to sleep at night with all the like massive sort of amount of pressure this must be <laughs> to like sort of get this right? <laughs> it's an interesting question. I, I definitely sleep well at night, but I do that because I think what we're, what we're working on is, is, is not just about kind of reframing business, but it's really trying to describe a better future for our society and our planet. So the work is extremely fulfilling. It's challenging, but it's also one of the, definitely one of the most exciting tasks that we have as, a, as an organization. And again, I think leveraging this idea that while listening to a variety of stakeholders and trying to consolidate their feedback and listen to varying opinions about the way in which we should try to change the world is hard. It's also what we are asking of companies to do. So we have to also represent and, and be a leader in the space of saying, listen, you can't just run off and tell people what to do. You need to listen to people. You need to understand their challenges. You need to understand why you know, some in the community may feel one way about the, us working with a scoring system or working with large multinationals and why others feel that it's really important that we do so. So this is the work that we do. This is the way we operate. And so while it may seem, it may sound and, and seem overwhelming, it's also just very ingrained in the way in which we work. And so we have great people, we have great processes to, to do that effectively. One of the things you touched on there was the variety of who's in the B Corp community, everyone from large you know, multinationals to single person marketing companies. And that is certainly and, and across industry. So from from every industry that you can imagine. And that's certainly one of the things that we're looking at within the new standard is is ensuring that the standard can be contextualized appropriately. So while the standard is going to um, be uh, applicable across all industries, all sizes, there will be variation within the standard. So if you're a small company um, with uh, a limited environmental footprint, 
your requirements are going to be slightly different to a larger consumer packaged goods company who has maybe a larger environmental footprint. So there will be contextualization in the standard, which allows us to then, as we hear feedback, adjust not just kind of one blanket requirement for all companies, but to tailor that appropriately for for different company sizes. And I think that's important because our ambition with this standard is that it's applicable to all companies all over the world. And and that is a big ambition, Um, but it's also a really important ambition because we think that it is possible for all companies to have a positive impact. Um, it can't, it's not just companies in the United States with five employees or with a, you know, a, a history that is aligned with exactly aligned with our mission. We think that other companies should be able to improve, even if it's going to be very hard for them sometimes. And, and so our ambition with this standard is that it's, um, it's used not by just by companies who want to be certified, but by any company in the world who wants to understand what does it mean to improve my social and environmental and governance impacts. And that I think is one of the special things about about the work on the standard is we're not doing it just for certification. We're doing it to be a guide for business across the world as to how they can improve their, the way that they do their work. And when, when you were at Fair Trade, did you all go through something similar to this of like revamping the standards, having a big stakeholder engagement process? And, you know, I imagine maybe similarly, yeah, there was it, like a lot of Some people felt very strongly about this should be in. Some people probably felt very strongly this should not be in. And so maybe you've seen a little bit of the vicissitudes of doing a new standard. Yeah, certainly. It's a fairly, I think anyone that's worked in standard setting and done this kind of consultation understands the dynamics that are at play there. You know, evolving or updating a standards is is really common in any, any standard setting organization for a few reasons. One, you have to evolve your standards as time moves on, right? Time, you know, the planet does not stay the same. Business does not stay the same. The urgency around certain issues does not stay the same. And so it's important that we are constantly evolving our standard. That's baked into our DNA. And I think every organization who is a standard setter um, also does that. In addition to that, you want to make sure that the standards remain relevant. The world moves on. As we said, when we started, when B Lab started 15 years ago or, or more, it was really a trailblazer and it was really paving a new way of doing business. And I think the the success is, is showing through in the fact that there's a much larger ecosystem now of organizations who are out there who are trying to make, who are supporting to make business a force for good. And as they do that, they develop new new ideas, new innovations. And so part of our work of evolving our standards is also to remain relevant. And so, yes, it's about listening to the competing dynamics between what one stakeholder wants and what another stakeholder wants. That's something I definitely saw at Fair Trade and I see here as well. But it's also about listening to experts and saying, okay, what if what if other people progressed further that we can take and we can learn from and we can incorporate into our work? And then it becomes not just a question of the stakeholder A want this or stakeholder B want that, but it's a growing consensus in this kind of broader industry about how you go about doing things. And so there's definitely a lot of connections that we have between the work we do as an organization and the work that other organizations do who are very focused on maybe very specific areas of impact that we're partnering with and that we're building on the back of the work they've done. And then finally, I think another thing with regard to the standard revision that's important is just bringing clarity. So companies want to understand as clear as possible, what do I need to do? It's really, it's challenging, right? You're trying to run a business. You're trying to keep everyone in your business having a a great place to work and delivering on your mission and being profitable and all these things. And so partly what we're trying to do is bring much more clarity to companies as to here's what it's going to take. And that's a really important part of our job, too. Uh, As you said, we've grown tremendously over the last couple of years. We now have coming up on close to 8,000 certified B Corps, and we're expecting significant growth in 2024 as well. And so we have both a mission and an operation to run. And part of the operation running is making sure the standards are as clear as possible. You know, I wanted to, I think where people get most sort of, and this is probably your experience at fair trade is around is on some of the edge cases, you know? So one of the things I appreciated about, have appreciated about the B Corp movement, you know, talking with Jay and, and some of the founders of B lab was around some of the original idea was take this, take away a company's good marketing around being good and give them standards so that you can, a, a consumer can really say like this company meets these standards. 
I want to just briefly touch on Nespresso because that's been a big topic in the B Corp community. And, you know, so in a way, like B Lab is looking at someone like Nespresso and they're saying, well, technically they've met the standards that as they have been designed, right? And there's still a strong like emotional reaction from a lot of people to say, it doesn't matter if they've met the standards, Nespresso and, and Nestle because of their history shouldn't be a B Corp because of, you know, it's, it's like coffee pods, even though they're aluminum. And it has driven a lot of like conversation and strong emotions in the B Corp community. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious how you sit with this tension between something like, you know, where standards organization that's standards driven and there's, even if a company meets certain standards, you're still going to have strong, like negative or maybe positive, you know, strong reactions to a company getting through the B Corp community. I'm just curious for your thoughts on how you balance that. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing is we really believe and are excited about the release of the new standard because we think that it is moving to a place where um, we can all certainly, and I think the entire community stand behind the fact that this standard is going to be what the world leading standard as it relates to what good performance looks like for businesses. And so when we, when we have that standard and we develop that in partnership with the community and we have a robust certification system on the backside of that, that's verifying it, we feel very comfortable standing behind the companies that end up achieving that. It's not easy to be a B Corp. It's not easy for any company to do it because it requires you to make really fundamental changes to the way you operate, starting with your purpose as a business, changing your kind of governance documents to say that you are establishing yourself not just for the sake of making profit, but that you have a wider purpose. Not And then following that through down to all of these various impact areas that are going to be d- defined in the new standard. So I think it starts with the standard and starts with the credibility of the certification system and being able to stand behind it and say, we understand that there are strong feelings about some companies, but we also understand that these companies have made tremendous and significant efforts to comply with a very difficult standard that most companies in the world will never be able to comply with. And so I think it starts with our ability to really do that and be able to say that clearly. And then I think it's really important that we educate the the rest of the, the, the community, those who are skeptical, um, both about what larger companies in particular are doing in order to improve their practices. Because I think, you know, don't get me wrong, I've worked in fair trade, I've worked in the space of um, trying to support companies for a long time. So I've been around this question of, are these large companies actually doing things differently? Or are they actually just using this as some sort of a mechanism to try to kind of communicate that they're better than we think they are? And I think that is the reason why these types of systems like Fairtrade and like um, B Corp certification exist so that we know that these companies are doing things. We have a lot of other companies out there in the world that are saying they're doing something without any oversight, without any credibility behind it, without a standard. And so I always find it interesting and sometimes a little frustrating to be having conversations when people are pointing fingers at the companies that are actually going through the effort of trying to get verified by a third party, trying to show that they're doing it well, when there's a whole bunch of other companies out there that aren't even making that level of effort and who are making claims that are not validated at all. And so, you know, it's an interesting ongoing dialogue we have to have in the community about saying why we believe strongly in our standard, we believe strongly in our system. We have data and evidence that shows that these companies are making improvements. And also educating people and directing the conversation, I think, to kind of some of those more periphery areas where the thing that that frustrates me the most is I have less concern about our work. And I I spend a lot more time worrying about the other 99% of the companies in the world who are making no effort. And so for me, the question is, how do we take our movement and move it into that other 99%? And what are the mechanisms we can do to do that so that we start having the discussion on the companies that really, really need to make even very minimal, even first step improvements and not on those companies that are clearly making a significant effort by even engaging and going through a program like ours. Yeah. And I think transparent, I think there's a certain amount of companies in the B Corp world or out there who want to be 
I mean, this goes back to the foundation of the B Corp movement. It's a tension that's always there. It's let's have a smaller club that's super high impact versus a bigger tent, which lets in more players, but then there's less maybe differentiation for those people who want to be seen as like way better and like a lot more high impact. And so it's uh it's a it's a challenge. It's been there since the beginning of the B Court movement. Who's in, who's out, small, small group that's high impact, but not maybe creating as much of an impact in the world versus bigger tent, which is maybe letting in more companies. But so I, I think it's been there. Yeah. I, I I get the I get the discussion and I understand the 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 emotions behind it and the and the interests that come with with that conversation. I think from our perspective, we believe that in order to achieve economic system change, we need to engage a wide group of companies across the world in varying sizes and varying degrees of sophistication. That said, we do think that the certification aspect of our work should be a high should be a high threshold of, of entry, right? You should be one of the best companies in the world to be able to end up having the B Corp certification. And that is the way that that it is. And I think that we will continue with that because what we want B Corp certification to mean, it needs to be an example to others that they can aspire to. And different sizes of companies need to aspire to maybe similar size companies. And so if we're only operating in a model where we don't engage with some of the larger companies, we aren't able to demonstrate the, the case that it is possible for companies of that size to do things better so that other companies can aspire to that. That, sa- that said, we do think that B Corp certification is high bar and, and challenging to attain. And we therefore need to think about how does our standard reach a much wider audience, not through certification necessarily, but as a tool and as a guide and as a, a playbook, if you will, for how those companies can improve on their performance. So it's a it's an interesting conversation. I really look forward to the feedback on the standard because as I said in the beginning, I think this question really starts with the standard. And if if we all believe that the standard is describing what good performance in social, environmental, and governance looks like, then I think we can all be very confident that companies that meet that are some of the most high performing companies that that there are. Yeah, how do you you know there there is some concern amongst existing B Corps or others that this will like quote unquote loosen the standard, like this change is loosening the standards and will allow in big companies. And I'm curious how you might respond to that concern. Yeah, I think you know the purpose of the process isn't necessarily at this stage to make the certification more or 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 less challenging, but really to make it more focused, more meaningful. And more impactful. And so that's why the focus on the consultation is important because if, if companies or others in the community do have a concern that this is going to maybe let less good companies in, we'd love to understand why they why they think that as part of the consultation process. My opinion on that is that actually this standard is going to do quite the opposite. I think it's going to be setting a really comprehensive approach to what a good sustainable performance looks like for businesses and any company that embarks on the effort to comply with that standard uh, is going to have to make significant effort significant commitment in order to do so and actually what we're going to see is that the best companies will continue to rise to the top and be the ones that are recognized as being the highest performance so i'm i don't really have the the concern at all that this is going to let more large companies in. I think what we're going to be doing is making sure that the companies that are part of the system are creating as much impact as possible. And I think that's really the intention that we're shooting for. And, you know, on the flip side, one of the things that's maybe come up, probably come up to your attention is around the the living wage and paying a family living wage. You know, there's some concern around manufacturing B Corps, at least in the in the US or North America, that like hey we're we're paying a, a good wage like maybe it's 20 bucks an hour but family living wage in our area is like $30 an hour and it would put me out of business to pay that and how how are the new standards keeping that sort of robust focus on like paying a fair wage while also the some of the business realities at least for a lot of the product and manufacturing b corps who maybe are you know 
Yeah, it's it's a great it's a great challenge, and I think all all companies are going to have to look at their their business models, the way in which they work, in order to uh, address the issues that we're raising as our very important issues that we think all businesses need to be looking at. Because what we do see is we have a large number of workers in the world who are being underpaid, who are not making ends meet, who are struggling, um, and which is why it's such an important topic for us. We believe that people should have the dignity of a, of a living wage, that they should have that in order to support their communities. That said, there are obviously some business realities that companies are operating within, and that's important to realize. And so partly what the standard is going to be looking at is there will be elements of flexibility in the standard according to the company's size, according to the company's sector and the geography and the business model. And so the higher expectations are going to fall on larger companies, realizing that they have the resources to address some of these issues more than some of the smaller companies do. So that's one aspect. The other thing is, again, you know, get to, to go back and harp on the consultation, we want to hear from companies. We want to hear from the companies who are have a small retail or small manufacturing and saying, we're going to really struggle with this. We want to hear why. We want to understand what we can do to support them. But ultimately, we do believe that business has a responsibility to pay living wages and that the best companies in the world will find ways of doing it. It may not be business as usual, but we're not asking for business as usual. We're asking for businesses to be a force for good. And sometimes that's going to require changes to the way things have been done in the past. And that's going to be true on wages. That's going to be true on environment. That's going to be true on climate. This is not a, our effort here is really to create change and changes takes time and change takes trade-offs and change takes um, commitment that is again beyond the way that they might normally do business. So I'm I'm very aware, and we, and we don't. We also think that it's going to be important for us to have a program that recognizes that change takes time. So sometimes there may need to be a little bit more time given for transition. So especially as we think about moving from our uh, current standard into the new one, and this is just true in general about the what we're trying to do in the world. People need time to change. We need an objective. We need goals. We need to understand the purpose behind what we're doing. And then we need a plan to get there. And sometimes that may mean that companies don't need to do stuff from day one, but they need to understand the roadmap that they're on and the steps that they're taking to get there. And I think for certain standards and certain criteria, that's going to be more important that we are sympathetic to that transition time and again, contextualize it based on the size of a company, where they're located, the sector that they work in as well. And what is the the vision for, for let's, let's say it's, you know, five years from now or 10 years from now, what is success? Like what, what could you look back and say, oh, this was a success. Like we did it. You know, we created these new standards. Does anything come to mind for you? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the standards are a tool, right? The standards are not our objective. The reason why we set the standards that we think that the standards are a guide for how businesses operate differently. And it's also a vision that we are putting in place about what a new society, a world looks like when businesses operate as a force for good. And that's ultimately leading to economic system change and a change in the way in which companies operate, whereby they think not just about profit, but they're also thinking about purpose. They're understanding their impacts on the world and they're adjusting their behaviors accordingly in order to be a force for good. So what does success look like for us in 10 years? It doesn't have to do with our certification system or even really the number of certified B Corps. It has to do with our ability to look back and see that this moment in time when we developed this standard, it set off a chain of events where companies were able to say, we understand that there is a way for us to do things differently. This standard is a guide for that. And we're able to follow that in order to change the way we operate. And by changing the way we operate, we will then influence the way others in our ecosystem operate. And that long-term change, which starts with a small step like the standard development, will ultimately lead to economic system change. So our ambition is that we see companies who have taken this as a guide and have started on the journey of improving the way they work in order to improve the way we all work and the entire system is is, is operating to move beyond shareholder primacy, beyond profit as the primary driver, but one which business is serving a purpose in the world. And 
You know, in the last couple of questions here, what do you need right now and how can the listeners help you grow this next economy? Yeah. Well, I think there's a few things. I think go to the stakeholder consultation website, which will be a link to that you can look at. Um, give us your feedback, any of your expertise, whether it's you as an individual, you as a business, you as a another nonprofit or a civil society organization who has a particular area of interest. Go to the site, give us your feedback. We'd love to hear from you. I think that's the first step. I think the other steps is to you know share the concept with your with your friends and family. You can find B Corp certified products on shelves all over uh, the United States and all over the rest of the the world as well. And so look for those. And when you see them, talk to your friends and family. Tell them about it. I think one of the um, one of the things that we have to do as a as an individual is when we know these things, we have a responsibility to also tell others about it. And so I've always been a big proponent of the kind of word of mouth spreading way of, of creating change. And that comes through part of my experience in fair trade and the idea that it's little things like buying a product with a fair trade label or buying a product with a B Corp label that makes the change. But actually what's really interesting in those moments is when you buy it and then you tell your friend about it and you show them that and you explain it to them. Because the biggest challenge I think we have is that we are trying to change a system that is very, very well ingrained into all of our beliefs, right? We, 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 are, we are conditioned and trained and structured to think about uh, business in a certain way. And we're trying to get you to think about it in a different way. And I think explaining that to your friends, your family, your colleagues, I think is one of the biggest things we could ask any listener to do. And any, um, anywhere else we can go to learn about your work at B-Lab, you know, maybe drop the website, any social media, anything like that? Yeah, I think you can go to the website. You can follow us on multiple social media. We are a network, actually. So uh, we have B Lab organizations who are working with companies and, and consumers all over the world. And so, pretty much in any country, you'll find a B Lab organization that is working in that country to spread the word, to work with companies. Um, and so we are very much all over various social medias and, and you can you can find us that way. And I'm sure we can we can put a couple of those links in as well. Awesome. Well, Clay, it's been a pleasure. I'm excited to see the new standards. And yeah, you know, I think the timeline is this the new standards would take effect in twenty twenty five, right? So this is sort of the That's right. Yeah, so it kind of it, it depends. The final timelines of when it's going to be implemented um, from a certification point of view depends on some of the feedback we get in the consultation. We're also developing a new technology platform because the standard itself, as a document, is is okay. But really, what we operate is also a technology platform where companies can go and access the standard. They can complete a self assessment where they can provide data and information and assess their own performance. And so, part of the standard revision process is also us developing a new technology platform. And that's going to be a tool that will be available to companies going forward after we launch it. And yeah, that's going to be a 2025 uh, effort. And But we will have the final standard published and available to everyone in 2024. And it looks like the public consultation for this standard will be from you know mid-January 2024 to 26th of March 2024. Yeah, it's running for a couple of months. So mid-January to, to mid to the end of March. Exactly. So everyone will have a chance to to provide that that feedback to us then. Well, Clay, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I uh, really appreciate you coming and explaining the new standards. Uh, you know, it's it's incredibly challenging task. And so I'm glad that your experience in fair trade sort of doing this is giving, is that good foundation for how to guide this this current process. And we'll have to get you back on the show, um, you know, maybe when there's a final version of the standards like okay here it is this is what's final yeah oh that'd be great i'd love it i'd love it we can go into a little bit more detail of the the content and because because as we said this is uh the the intention behind this standard and the the details there are really important because they're trying to tell businesses these are the issues that you need to focus on if you want to be a high performing business that has is doing good in the world helping people, helping the planet and operating in a way that is is better than than traditional business. So yeah, looking forward to that. And I'd love to go into some of the details of what that looks like next time. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. 
You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Before you go, we wanted to let you know that our spring cohort of the Next Economy MBA begins on March 26th. If you're an entrepreneur seeking to create a business that works for all life, a member of a team looking to transition your organization into one that is more regenerative and democratic, or someone who's considering a career or livelihood transition in embodiment with your values, we designed this course for you. Over this nine-month learning journey, you'll have the chance to learn practical skills around business and life design based on our work with over 250 social enterprises. In addition to live sessions, you can deepen your experience and practice with special sessions, affinity groups, and connections with over 500 alumni who have participated in the course. Interested in learning more? Visit lifteconomy.com forward slash MBA to view our course curriculum and sign up for a free intro with one of our facilitators. If you're ready to sign up, you can use the code podcast MBA to save 10% on tuition. We hope you'll join us.